She gave him a tongue lashing for remarrying after promising her on her deathbed that he would never marry another. Oh, well, he probably shouldn't have said that. Shouldn't have said that if you're going to do it, George. Hello, welcome to Guide to the Unknown. I'm Kristen. And I'm her little brother, William. And this week we are traveling to Maine, home of Stephen King and many of his stories. And home to many spooky things and ghosts. Yeah. Have Um, you ever been to Maine? You know, I think I have. Hmm. Maybe very, very briefly, I think I have. Yeah. It looks beautiful. Oh, yeah. So our friend Tommy moved to Maine Uh and his sister Sarah, who we talk about all the time, she's my best friend, um, has traveled there a whole bunch and she says it's completely awesome. She loves it. I think he lives in Portland, Maine, if not like close to it or something. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, I I took a look at our statistics. Yeah. I haven't done this in a while. Oh, yeah. When we do like a location. We've done done location-based episodes in the past where we find out, I'm making this up now, but like we find out that Michigan Mm -hmm. doesn't listen to Guide to the Unknown. Right. So we specifically do an episode focused on Michigan to see if it moves the numbers. Yeah, and make it bid to get them to listen. Yes. I took a look at our up-to-date stats Mm -hmm. um, without being too gauche. Yeah. uh, Because it's relevant. Trust me, it's relevant. It's It's a humble brag, but I promise it's relevant. Great. Guide to the Unknown. The podcast form, the video ver- version is far down. And also we wouldn't know that. I don't know if they show those sorts of stats on YouTube. Not quite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The audio version of Guide to the Unknown has millions of listens. Yeah. Millions and millions. Yeah. Okay. How many listens all oh, time? Oh, God. All time. You can give either give it to me as a percentage. You can say 3%, whatever, mm-hmm. or you can give me a, a hard, fast number. Five people you think have ever listened to Guide to the Unknown in Maine. I know. I know the number. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm going to say 2%. 2% yeah. of our 2 million. It's it's almost 2.5. I looked yeah, today. Yeah, something like that. Uh, no. Okay. No. Uh, I uh, Less than 10,000 people have ever listened to Guide to the Unknown in Maine, <laughs> which constitutes about... Uh, Less than 0.5%. Okay, very good. <laughs> so no one in Maine listens. Well, maybe they will after today. Exactly. I'm we'll curious see. to see yeah. what happens. Bring them in. I'm very curious to see. Yeah. We do have a Maine listener who is watching right now in yeah. our chat because we record live on youtube.com slash pod every week. Um, it's Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And it, our episode has, you know, the name up and somebody said, oh, I live in Maine. Yes. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. We've got at least one yeah, person yep. in Maine. Just Aaron. Yes. And yeah, Aaron, you, please Aaron. spread the good word. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to talk a little bit about Maine. I found something that I thought was pretty cool. Okay. I-, I like this kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, Maine is home to America's first ghost story. That's right. You said this. I know. I'm curious. The They call it the first haunting in America. Huh. And it is novel. Yeah. It's unique. It, and it, and it's pretty interesting. The story is the novel story, and unique? The story itself. Oh, I mean, that okay. is a novel thing to brag about, too, yeah. right? Like, Maine is home to the earliest American ghost story. Right. I didn't know if it was true or you were joking about being novel because there are, like, you know, 15 most haunted houses in America. Totally true, or whatever. I, I mean, you know? yeah. To that, to that extent, I cannot verify that There's this like is literally. Like the Paley literally... House, the Sally House, yeah. the Conjuring House. Like all of them are the most haunted. Everywhere can't be the most haunted right. place, and I have to assume there are ghost stories that predate this. Yeah, but yeah. I have. I okay. I, I think I have to get into sort of telling you about it to give you my analysis of the situation, Great. whether or not it is the first haunting in America. Okay, sounds good to me. So I'm going to tell you the story. Of Nellie Butler. Mm. And this is almost like an urban legend along with a haunting. A very strange case. Cool. So I've got two prime sources. The first of which is newengland.com. You can check our sources for everything on Mm -hmm. our main website. Uh, You can do gttupod.com. We actually just changed the website to be scaryfun.fun. Yep. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Go to scaryfun.fun, everybody. That's our new website. Yeah, it's fun. It's to- the same website, just with a new URL. Right. It'll be fun to type in. Yeah, scaryfun.fun. <laughs> <laughs> Scary Fun is like our overreaching company. Yeah, our That's company. why it's that. Yeah. yeah. So, Nellie Butler, uh, her story was 
uh, first published in Yankee Magazine. Oh, Yankee boy. Yankee boy. I wrote here, look at my notes, it says, hey, Yankee boy. <laughs> Anytime I see the word Yankee, I think about, hey, Yankee boy. There's an episode on our second podcast, The Netherworld Dispatch, <laughs> which is on our Patreon, where we were watching Unsolved Mysteries, and there was a guy who saw a UFO, and he was from, I can't remember, I don't remember where, where right now, but he wasn't like a Native American, or like he wasn't Native to America, he moved here from another country, and... For some reason, when he saw the UFO, well, I guess it's not for some reason. He assumed that it was like a government experiment. Yeah. So when it landed and the door opened, he started yelling, hey, Yankee boy. Hey, Yankee, Yankee boy. boy. <laughs> because I guess whoever is going to be there is a patriot. It's fascinating. Hey, <laughs> so Yankee funny. boy. So the story was first published in Yankee magazine in 1994, almost exactly 30 years ago. Mm. Uh, now, there's been a lot of debate about where this story takes place, but AmericanGhostWalks.com seems to have it on good authority that this occurred in the small coastal town of Sullivan, Maine. This is the haunting of Nellie Butler, Chrissy. Mm-hmm. Okay. It was August 9th, 1799, when Abner Blaisdell first heard a knocking noise in his house, and on January 2nd, 1800 it seemed to gain power so at the end of 1799 it starts as a series of knocks yeah by 1800 this ghost has enough ability to manifest a voice and start talking oh man both abner and his daughter lydia heard a woman's voice coming from the cellar of their house real quick it being something that happened kind of from Night or whatever it was, 1799 to 1800, also kind of plays into the idea of ghosts or spirits or supernatural beings somehow being drawn to the concept of liminality. Oh, because a basement is is sort of an odd place, you mean? No, I was thinking like an in-between space, like from 1799 to 1800. Oh, you're thinking about the time period. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 1799 to 1800. It's, it seems like to some people, and I really like this idea that somehow ghosts are more able to come through or, or, or anything supernatural creatures or whatever um, when it's an in-between sort of space. And that can mean all kinds of things. That can mean bridges. That can mean a transition time for a person, like um, moving from being married to divorced. Or, yeah, it could day to day. Like nighttime is like a transition from the day to the next day or whatever. You know what I mean? So, But then everything is liminal. Yes, it is, basically. <laughs> It honestly, yes, but still, it works. It works. I know. It's one of those things where it's like once you once you open everything up to interpretation, you can interpret things so much. Yeah, and that there's can, a little room for things not to be weird. Totally, because you can go crazy granular. Like right now was like the liminal space between me sitting upright and yeah, leaning exactly. back in my chair. Right. That's why I thought you at first. I thought you were maybe referring to the basement because it's like mm-hmm. a basement is subterranean, but it's part of your everyday home. Like right. It's sort of neither here nor there. Or the something. stairs would be liminal because they're the in between. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. All mm-hmm. right. Well, so Abner and his daughter now hear a woman's voice coming from their cellar. This is the beginning of 1800. I'm the dead wife, the voice said. Of Captain Gerard, uh, Ch- Captain George Butler, <laughs> Captain Gerard Butler, Captain. <laughs> Gerard, you started saying Gerard. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe that's why I started saying Gerard. Yeah. Gerard Jerry Butler. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm the dead wife of Captain George Butler. Mm. That's what the voice said. Now here's where I get into. Okay. I'll just go ahead and say why I think they they call this the first American haunting. Mm-hmm. S- America is what like they signed the Constitution in 1776. Right. So but, this is this is you know twenty four years later. Right. It's pretty soon later. Yeah. For a big ghost. So it's like uh, once we're formally founded, this is the first ghost story. Are yeah. there not ghost stories? You know, after fourteen ninety two, when Columbus sailed the ocean blue. There's certainly must to seventeen seventy six. This is just no like way that we went twenty four years sans ghost story. It's a it technicality. Must be, it must be the only one that was like committed to paper or something yeah. like that. It kind of. It reminds me of us talking, I think, last week during Celebrity Ghost Stories. I think that was last week, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, about how Shelley Long was saying, and I had heard it as well, that the Northeast is particularly haunted because we have a longer history right. there. Yeah. However, like, yeah, we as like 
colonizing Americans have a longer history there, but people were living there already. Yeah. So you can't really say, oh, it, it's got this, you know, reputation because it's the first. Right. It's really not. So it's the oldest I part of the founded America. Yeah. So I think it's probably the same yeah. kind of thing. Like yeah. you whatever you say is old is kind of whatever is marked down first. Exactly. Yeah. History is written by the, the the as Jimmy Eat World told us. The past is told by those who win, my darling. That's right. And uh, I listened to that a lot. Yeah. You ever listen to Jimmy, Jimmy Eat World? Yeah, Jimmy Eat World rules. I listened to Jimmy Eat World more than I care to admit. Jimmy I, Eat I liked World it. is totally sweet. I liked it a lot. Yeah. All right. Yeah. <clears throat> anyway. <clears throat> so. Okay. Oh, oh, what I was saying. Mm -hmm. So I think this is technically the first American ghost story. Right. Because of America being conventionally founded our government was in place yeah yeah okay i did think it was surprising when i started looking into the story called like the the oldest haunting in america mm -hmm. that it starts with a family living in a house going "Ooh, we've got a ghost yeah because if it's the first why do they even have that kind of language for it is that what you mean or or, or like it's weird that it doesn't start with nelly butler as a living breathing person who yeah. died mm -hmm. and then came back it starts with Abner Blaisdell saying, I think we've got a ghost. Yeah, that is interesting. It's weird. Yeah, it's not the story of her becoming a ghost. It's the story of somebody experiencing her as a ghost. Yeah. yeah. Isn't that strange? Yeah. So, so, and again, and this oh, no, is it, I don't know. I guess it's our way in. Uh, it's our way. Yeah. It's just yeah. our way in. Yeah. It's just, uh, the story takes so many strange, the, the story is so unusual for how you conventionally think of stories of hauntings, uh -huh. like things that we've covered in the past before, where it's like, there's a ghost in this house and we're trying to make sense and we're not sure if there's a ghost or some yeah. things are moving here. We get hard, fast facts about this ghost mm -hmm. and their life and their loved ones. Yeah. So again, the first confirmed thing that the ghost is said to have, uh, have vocalized is I'm the dead wife of Captain George Butler. Man. And goes on to say, I was born Nellie Hooper. Uh-huh. Nellie Butler uh, uh, was a known person to Abner Blaisdell, whose oh. house this is. It's it's so strange. I wonder why she didn't just start with that then. You know what I, I know. Mean? Like, I'm Nellie Butler. I mean, maybe it was because I would assume at the time, I don't know, like men are kind of the more important marker of who you ah, are. Ah, that's interesting. Yeah, she had to sort of like stake her identity. Y yeah, I wonder. I don't know. So Abner Blaisdell knew of Nellie Butler because she had only died three years earlier in this community, mm -hmm. not in this house or anything, huh. just in the general area. Yeah. So she died at 21 years old, three years prior, uh, in childbirth. Mm -hmm. The child also died. Mm. Abner Blaisdell knows Captain George Butler, huh. who still lives vaguely in the area. He knows the ghost's former husband, Weird. the widower. Yeah. And can contact him and say, hey, I think you better come down here. The ghost of your wife is talking to me. Right. And he will come down. It's very, very strange. Wowee. To complicate things further. Yeah. Because again, I'm telling you, this is an odd tale. Abner Blaisdell has a 15-year-old daughter named Lydia, who, I wrote, like Lydia Dietz before her, <laughs> Finds herself drawn to the ghost living in her house now. She has a preoccupation with the macabre. As they say. Yes. It even made me wonder if Lydia Dietz gets her name from Lydia Blaisdell. That's an interesting idea. Who, was, who was drawn to this ghost living in the house. Right. Maybe. Maybe. Lydia it's not. It, no, seriously. It's not impossible. Right. And I don't know. I, Did I Tim Burton write Beetlejuice? I think so. Okay. I, it's not, whoever wrote Beetlejuice, it's not impossible that they read this story. It's not impossible. You know, and got some sort of inspiration from it. Completely not impossible. I'm now almost like kicking myself for not checking. Yeah. Also, does Beetlejuice take place in Maine? I think it's like a New Englandy, or maybe it it's like, seem like it. I'll look. a Massachusetts-y type place. I'll find out. So uh, as you as you look that up, mm -hmm. I'm gonna say here from American Ghost Walks, much like a classic poltergeist, what starts out as just audio haunting becomes something more intelligent and communicative as time goes on. And they also point out that a lot of this seemed to orbit around Lydia Blaisdell, hmm. the way that we talked about poltergeists. We have like an episode about poltergeists 
and we talked about the idea that like a lot of poltergeist activity seems to orbit around uh, teens. Yeah. Like pubescent age people. Mm -hmm. Because there's a lot of hormones, a lot of energy going on, and that's where poltergeist activity seems to orbit. Yeah. And so people say that it's kind of like their kinetic energy and not a ghost. It's just like basically if their hormones can be made physical outside of them right. that is what ma- is making clocks fall off of walls and stuff like that yeah okay yes exactly yeah uh, by the way beetlejuice t- takes place in winter river connecticut great name interesting yeah okay mm-hmm. so northeasty maybe a stretch to, to say that they're connected but it does but it, it could still be inspired by yeah it still story. doesn't seem impossible yeah no. right i'm gonna have some more uh upsetting information about lydia but i'll save it for later okay so let's get weird all right. So, as I mentioned, Abner Blaisdell knew people who were still alive related to this Nellie ghost. Yeah. Nellie Butler, a.k.a. Nellie Hooper. Right. Before she was married. So, Abner Blaisdell was a sergeant in the Revolutionary War. And they say that because of that, he was, quote, brave enough to talk to whatever voice was coming out of the basement. I thought that was interesting that it's like, I've been in war, therefore I'm brave enough to talk to a ghost. Yeah, I can can do anything. Kind of interesting. So, Abner knows Dennis Hooper. Mm Mm-hmm. That's weird that... Dennis Hooper, Dennis Hopper. I know. I almost said Gerald Butler before. Gerard. Or Gerard Butler. Yeah. And now we've got Dennis Hooper. Huh. (laughs) Strange. Anyway, Dennis... Star-studded. Star-studded this episode. So Dennis Hooper lives just a few miles down the road, and he is Nellie Butler's father. Okay. Okay? And her ex-husband... Why is her last name not Hooper? Because she got married to George. Oh, Butler. Okay. She married George. I know it's all this name stuff. Yeah. Her dad is Dennis and her ex-husband is George. Gotcha. All right. So they get involved. Uh, They come to Abner Blaisdell's basement to talk to the ghost of their daughter and wife, Mm -hmm. respectively. So this is uh, this is what uh, Dennis, the father, Dennis Hooper had to say, quote, after walking five miles through a raging snowstorm, uh, Hooper joined Abner in the cellar and said she gave such clear and irresistible tokens of her being the spirit of my own daughter. Hmm. Which is even just like an indication of the time. He had to walk five miles right. through a raging snowstorm to to get there, which is like just like all of our parents getting to school. <laughs> yeah, uphill both ways. Yep. I, I did realize I, I had to walk to school. Yeah. Somebody I'm gonna tell that to Zoe and it's gonna be like, What? It's gonna be true. What are you talking about? Yeah. Yeah. I know. I never did. It's so strange. Yeah. So um uh so he had to walk five miles in a snowstorm because it's the 1800s. Yeah. Not knowing what he's going to get himself into. And he gets there. And this voice in the basement of Abner Blaisdell <laughs> seems to be his daughter. Well, thank goodness it was worth his while. Yeah, I guess him, so. Yeah. Know? Yeah. Similarly, Nellie had a living sister, Sally. Sally also came by saying that the voice she heard in the basement, quote, brought fresh to my mind that of my sister's voice. Hmm. In 1800 speak. Vocally, she sounded like my sister, this voice in the basement. On? And I, I I don't have a great description either of like, what happens? You go to the basement and what? The voice is just in the room or it's like right. you're talking to a hole in the wall or I, I, I don't well, know. Yeah, I don't know. But I guess I imagine when when uh, her dad said tokens, he just kind of means like he kind of kind of means like proof. Like yes. she said little things that indicate that this has to be her or whatever. Yeah. Like, so I guess it is just like you go down there and she's like, dad. You know what I mean? Right, like it yeah, sounds yeah, yeah. like she has an or awareness like, of who is down there or I, something. Or or like, you know, like I'm a ghost, right? And you come down to a basement and mm-hmm. I start talking to you about like Grand Theft Auto. Yeah. You know? Yeah, the huge. The huge. And you're like, he gave me like a token that it was it was Will because yeah. he started talking about uh, Donald Love, <laughs> uh, who was voiced by uh, Dale Cooper. What's his name? Kyle McLaughlin. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Plays a character oh, named a Donald guy. Love in Grand Theft Auto and it's hinted that he's a cannibal and stuff. Right. It's like, oh, that was Will. So that's Will. He just, I, he gave me many tokens. He knew all this stuff about Donald Love from Grand Theft Auto 3. It's incredible. So <laughs> really is. now she's talking to her sister, Sally. And Sally says it sounds like her sister, Nellie. Mm-hmm. Uh, but also, Nellie started saying weird poetic stuff. Mm-hmm. Quote, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Weird. The hell does that Lofty, mean? Lofty, you know? Yeah. And then this is what Sally had to say. And we can only extrapolate stuff from this next quote. Sally said this after hearing her dead sister's voice, seemingly. 
From this time, I cleared Lydia as the voice and accused the devil. Oh. I'll read this. I'll, I'll tell you what I think it means, then I'll read it again. Okay. It's 1800 speak, so right. it's a little outside of our convention. Yep. She, I think, is saying, as anybody might assume, this house has a 15-year-old girl in it. It's not impossible that this girl is doing this voice mm -hmm. and making everybody think there's a ghost. Yeah. Uh, so the quote again, from this time, I cleared Lydia as the voice, right? I don't, yeah. I don't think Lydia's doing the voice. Yep. Uh-huh. It's not Lydia doing the voice. I cleared Lydia as the voice, right. And accused the devil. Is so. this, is this a God fearing person's like the afterlife doesn't exist or something? This is a demon trying to fool us into thinking it's Nelly. That's what I thought. And it probably because we do this show and we look at this stuff all the time or whatever, um, yeah, that's what I was thinking it meant is that it was like a demon trying to fool her into thinking it's Nelly. So they like hang around and then the demon does something the demon bad. gets into your soul. Or, yeah. yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Um, there is a later thing that occurs where, uh, cause people keep talking to this ghost Nelly. Yeah. N Nelly becomes almost like famous. Uh huh. And at a certain point somebody says, do you think that your sister believes that it's really you Nelly or yeah. does she still believe it's the devil or something? And the ghost Nelly says, now she believes. Oh. Like it took some convincing, but she's coming around and it's like, how do you know? Yeah. Like what are you in her head? Is the 15 year old girl there all the time? The daughter? Unclear. Yeah. Unclear. Mm -hmm. But here's, here's what stuff starts to go on. The Nelly ghost starts to get bolder. So far we've had Nelly talking to the family that lives in the house. Right. Or her surviving family members. Mm -hmm. All right. But now Nelly appears visually for the first time. To Abner Blaisdell's son, Paul. How old's Paul? I, I have no, I have no idea. But this is a weird event. Yeah. All right. So Paul runs home one night, reporting that he was walking through the fields and was chased by the apparition that quote floated behind him. Mm -hmm. That night, Nellie scolded Paul for not speaking to her when she, when he saw her. What? I appeared to you in the field, Paul, and you ran away from me. Why didn't you say me. hi to me? Why didn't you say hi? Yeah, I so was right there. I wrote, it's like a ghostly Seinfeld scene. <laughs> yes, totally. No hello? Yep, I was thinking the exact same thing. It's like an Uncle Leo thing. You <laughs> yeah. could at least say hi. Yeah, right. Uh, but how strange is that? I'm going to scold you, Paul, because uh -huh. you didn't say hi to me. You ran away from me in the Interesting. field. Interesting. So I wonder if Paul just got creeped out in the field. I'd be scared. Totally, but... Then how did Nellie know about it? She was really there. Yeah, right. It, was it really wow. was her ghost manifesting outside in front of Paul, I guess. Maybe. So now we're about a month later. It's February nineteen or February 1800 now. Mm -hmm. And Nellie's ghost is basically famous. Yeah. The story of Nellie's ghost is spreading far and wide. People have begun gun coming over to the Blaisdell house, crowding down in the basement to talk to Nellie's ghost. Oh, man. Which is, is so bizarrely like plausibly what you would assume would happen if there was yeah. a, a haunting around here. People would start to flock to it, right? Yes, totally. Now, I wonder if they charged or anything. I know. Yeah. From a little business, uh -huh. a little cottage industry. So I guess people were going hoping to see something and it seems like they went and did not come away disappointed. Hmm. Quote, at first the apparition, oh, uh, she appears again in the basement in front of people. Okay. And this is one of the witnesses saying this. At first the apparition was a mere mass of light. Then it grew into a personal form, about as tall as myself. And then, and the glow from the apparition had a constant tremulous motion, which I think of as being like a candle flickering or yeah, something. Mm -hmm. right? Like it's like wavering light. Yep. At last, the personal form became shapeless expanded every way and then vanished in a moment. What the hell's going on here? This is what witnesses or at least one witness claims to have seen. Yeah. Now, Nellie has been doing this, uh, I guess doing little shows for people or people are coming down to gawk at the ghost of Nellie. I hope she feels like doing this. Well, I don't think she did. Nellie disappears for about four months. Okay. Stop showing up. All yeah, of a sudden, it's like a gone. daily you have to do a little tap dance for people for God knows how many hours. Right. I came back and I had talked to this family for a while and I got to talk to my loved ones who lived beyond my death. Right. And now all these people are coming here to like stare at me and I have to put on a show for them and stuff. Yeah. So she disappears for four months. In May, she comes back. Abner Blaisdell asks why 
now that she's back, he's like, why are you here? Mm -hmm. Why did you come to the basement? Why are you only in the basement now? You never come upstairs. You never appear anywhere else. I guess aside from the field that one time in front of his son. Yeah, I kind of forgot that there's the question of why even at their house? Why are you in my house? Why are you in the basement only? Right. Like not, why not your father's house or your late husband's house? Yeah. More specifically, he seems to be worried about why only the basement. Okay. And she says that she's only in the basement because she doesn't want to frighten any more children. Which I wonder if that's a reference to Paul. She tried to appear in front of that son, uh-huh. Paul, and then he ran home and she scolded him for not talking to her. Right. Now she only, she just stays in the basement. Well, I mean, she was only staying in the basement before that, though, right? Yeah. I guess she had the one sojourn out. But maybe, like, but maybe, then maybe before she, like, set up camp in the basement, maybe, maybe she had scared a child in the town or something. You're right. Maybe. Who's to say? I don't right. know. But she doesn't want to be scaring people. She just, What am I supposed to do? This is what I am. I'm a ghost now. Yeah, right. People so you're are like, afraid of me. I'm going to go somewhere where there aren't, like, a ton of people for me to scare. Yeah, exactly. And you have to wonder what the clergy thought of all this, right? I, William, it came to mind, yeah. Oh, I can answer that question for you if you'd like. Perfect. So there's a holy man in town named Reverend Cummings. He's skeptical Mm -hmm. of the ghost of uh, Nellie Butler, knee Nellie Hooper. (laughs) And he does not like the idea that his flock is believing in this ghost, Mm. right? It's a bunch of hooey. Yeah. So, quote, in a foul temper, Cummings- I mean, I guess it's sacrilege because it's, it's, yeah, yeah. yeah, like people aren't supposed to be essentially rising from the grave. Yeah, exactly. You know, that's the domain of- one ombre. Uh-huh. The yeah. one and only. Yep. So in a foul temper, Cummings strode through the fields to Abner's house, which I picture, <laughs> we already know that it took Nellie's father five miles yeah. through a snowstorm. I like to think of this reverend having one consistent foul temper, even though right. it takes like Just five stopping. hours to get there. Yeah. It never wavers. He doesn't get angrier. He doesn't get less angry. Nope. He, he just gets stops. there and it's status quo anger. Uh, suddenly before him was a woman, quote, Surrounded by a bright light, at first her form was no bigger than that of a toad. This again, <laughs> Quite small. This again is where this is just an unusual haunting. Yeah, right? we've already got the idea that this is great. I think it's I think it's fascinating. Yeah. I, I I I can't believe I've never heard these things in ghost stories before. No, her ghost is there, and her loved ones are able to come and visit her. Right, that's weird. Yeah, it totally is. And now she's appearing before the Reverend, the good Reverend. And maybe Cummings. it is that she could go and be in their houses, but like, I don't know, maybe they don't have basements. It seems like she has found a safe space where she's not going to feel bad about scaring right. anybody. Or maybe she's able to draw power and manifest because of the 15-year-old Lydia. Yes, that's right. right. That's, that's not right. impossible. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so she appears in front of the Reverend, at first no bigger than that of a toad. She then grows to a full height, a full height, and that convinced the good Reverend. Now he's a believer. Oh, boy. He wasted all of that foul mood on the way over. I know. Yeah. All that steam. <laughs> yeah. But after this moment, after she appears first the size of a toad, mm-hmm. which that's weird, too, that yeah. a ghost is teeny tiny and then gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Like, it's – you don't think about that. You think of no. a ghost being one consistent size. It's totally weird. It's like when in The Frog Prince on – um. What's her name? Shelley Duvall's yeah, yeah, yeah. fairy tales or whatever. Remember Robin Williams is the frog prince and first he's a little frog and then he turns into Robin Williams in like a leotard? Yeah, yeah. Being yeah. weird? Yeah. It, it's just weird. It, it implies like a whole different fairy set of- Fairy tale theater. That's what I'm trying to say. Fairy tale theater, yeah. Mm-hmm. It implies a whole different set of like physics and logic for the ghost world. Yes. Which I like. To, I know. A voice only. Now I can manifest physically, but I can be tiny and then I have to grow big. I wonder if it's almost like she's like learning skills or something. Right? It's fascinating. Yeah, it it's is. It's very, very strange. She's been around enough on the physical plane because they're like, you know, groups of people are coming to see her. She's spending time mm-hmm. as a speaking ghost. Like, maybe she has the time to get this going and, and learn and experiment. Maybe. I don't know. Hmm. But so, again, after this, after she convinces the Reverend, she's done. Uh-huh. She basically stops appearing at all. Maybe and it here's, took too much energy. That's what I thought. So, yeah. I wrote this down. Was she out of energy? Or tired of being a spectral spectacle. Mm, ooh. Tired of people being afraid of her. Yeah. And this is where I came to this this idea. It must suck to be a ghost mm-hmm. and have everyone either be afraid of you all the time or have everybody like crowd around you just to stare at you and point at you. Right. It's like it's like And like communicating them with them, the people who are staring pointing at you is super hard. It seems like yeah. you can't even just have like 
a normal relationship or something where mm. you're like sitting and shooting the shit or whatever. Yeah. Like you have to be like summoning up all this, like, <clears throat> like taking Lydia's weird kinetic hormonal yeah. energy yeah, from yeah, upstairs yeah. that would otherwise knock over a chair and siphoning it so that you can so speak. you can communicate. Yeah. Yeah. It seems incredibly debilitating mm -hmm. to be a ghost. Yeah. And it might have just been more trouble and heartache than it was worth yeah. to stick around. Yeah. I've tried this for a few months and it sucks. Right. Kids are afraid of me and people just want to stare at me. And I, I feel like I can't even leave the basement. Uh-huh. It's like enough, yeah, does... enough already. I'm done. Right. Like the amount any hard thing you've done for a prolonged period of time that you've eventually been like, this isn't worth it. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> it's yeah. I think about that quite a bit, Kristen. Oh, me too, William. Uh, but like, of course you would bounce. Yeah. You know what I mean? I th totally. I've never thought about that in relation to a ghost though. That I it honestly must, haven't either. It must suck to be dead. Yeah. And it's a form of, it's a form of like, this is a really, really weird thing. I always think about this though, in relation to death. Cause mm -hmm. I saw, I saw, I mean, we've seen plenty of death, Yeah, but I've also seen examples of like, a, a it's, it's like a metaphorical death. So follow me. Mm -hmm. I think I've talked about this before. I used to work a, 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 what you'd call like a conventional office job, a day job. Yep. And there was a day where uh, it was poorly handled, but somebody was being laid off. And strangely, what they said to this person was, um, yeah, we're letting you go. So finish out the next two weeks <laughs> and then you're out of here. That's crazy. And they turned this woman from an employee that you would just walk past in the hall yeah. to now a, a, a ghost mm -hmm. or like a, like a dying person. Soon I'll be gone, yeah. but I'm not gone yet. Yeah. And I could see this effect that it had on everybody. One, she was totally destabilized as anybody is in this, in this position. You're here, but you're not here. Right. You know what I mean? Like, uh, like it's almost like a form of senioritis, but of like being forced to let go. Yeah. And it sucks. Yeah. And for everybody else, it was like having this corrosive person now who used to be your regular coworker, but now is walking around being like, well, good luck here. Yeah, totally. And now they are like a fountain of bad morale. Mm -hmm. One, it's sad to see them at all. Of course. Two, they're poisoning the well of of good yeah, faith now in your they're company. Like pissed at the company and at work. Yeah. And they're showing you how much the company that you still depend on sucks. Yes. And I've I always thought about that as like a little death, mm -hmm. where it's like uh, we've known loved ones who've been in the hospital and are 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 dying in front of your eyes, mm -hmm. and it's hard to be there. Yes. And you may you love them. But it's hard to be there. And, yeah. it, and it takes a little chunk out of you while you're doing it. Yes, very hard. Because death and life are incompatible. Mm -hmm. You want to care for them, but yeah. it's siphoning something out of you yeah. to be doing it. Yeah, And uh, uh, this is like weirdly the other side. Mm -hmm. A ghost who tries to linger in the world of the living is like, I don't belong here. And it's right. all different now. I'm not like you anymore. As much as I wish I could just be normal and talk to my former husband and talk to my dad. Yeah. I don't belong here. And it's having a crazy effect on all of you. Yeah. So it doesn't work like that. And it's making my experience a nightmare. So totally. I'm going to stop appearing. I'm out. Yeah. I'm going like, into the light willingly or whatever, you know? Right. That's kind of what I was about to say. Like if you play by those rules or thought process that... Um, pe like people who you can see as ghosts are somehow in limbo. Like they're yeah. here because they have unfinished business, they always say or whatever. Right. So that like especially sucks. However, that, I mean, who knows about any of this stuff, but you know, I kind of believe in ghosts. I'm more, sure. I'm more want to believe. Yes. But I, but I, I do, I do at the end of the day. But anyway, I don't, who the hell knows, but I don't really think that. I guess I think that like, some of them decide to come and go and I right. don't know why or whatever. And for even them, maybe they are going more than coming because coming is super hard because like, yeah. just like for it takes us, great pains and effort, just like for us, it was really heartbreaking to see somebody in the hospital dying and not being able to communicate the way that you want to yeah, and yeah, seeing yeah. them in pain and things like that. Like, it's sort of flipped where like the ghost, they can't communicate. They want to with us now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it, that that is painful and yeah. for them because they're already dead they have an out that we don't have because we want to stay with our loved one until they right, died yeah, or yeah. whatever Absolutely. but for them they're like 
I'm already gone. They're not even sure I'm here at all. I think I need to accept because, it. Because like they don't yeah. know if ghosts are real or not. They can't right. they always keep, they keep questioning my yeah. my existence. They can't hear me. Like they can't me. always tell that I like, you yeah. know, nudged a door or something. So why not just call the whole thing off? It's time. And I'll just like peace. Yeah, that's very interesting. Uh, yeah, it, it's who knows? Uh, it's something I've never thought about before me neither. in relation to ghosts. It's very and, and so I, I love that it comes from I, I love the the idea of being able to like the first American ghost story is fascinating on all these levels. It really is. It's just so strange. Yeah. Now I do have I do have some uh, conf conflicting info mm -hmm. from my my two prime sources uh, about the upsetting Lydia stuff. Oh right. Uh -huh. Ready. Mm -hmm. So, uh, AmericanGhostWalks.com says that you know they say ghosts have unfinished business. Yeah. They sort of posit, or just in relaying seemingly facts from the era, that the ghost of Nellie had a goal. Okay. And the goal was to get her widower, her former husband, George Butler, to remarry. Uh-huh. And uh, he wanted remarry her- Lydia. Yeah, she, she seemingly wanted him to marry Lydia. Mm. He was 29, she was 15. Not good. It's the year 1800, everybody. Yeah. Lydia was quote unquote reluctant. Oh, you don't say. <laughs> that sounds right. That's surprising. But I guess what, the ghost was insistent? Mm -hmm. Or George? Come oh, so on. they did get married? They get married. Okay. Now, at some point dur during the Nelly haunting, George comes to the house and he asks, who are you? Mm -hmm. Here's the response from the supposed ghost of his wife. I was once your wife, which is a very like. <laughs> Don't just say Nelly. Yeah. Yeah. I was once your. It's like it's like a Christmas carol. It's Dickensian. Yeah. It's yeah. Like, In life, I was your partner, Jacob and Robert Marley. Right. Just say your names, dude. I was once your wife. Do you not remember that I told you when I was alive? Do you not remember I told you I did not think I should live long with you? Oh. Yeah, this is very, it's ghost talk. Now we're getting real ghosty and weird, right? Yeah. It's like accusatory and like, I, I don't remember, huh? What does that mean? What? I don't yeah. remember. <laughs> right. So the ghost of Nellie supposedly then predicts to George, you will marry Lydia mm -hmm. and Lydia will die. Oh. She will die in childbirth like me. One year later, Lydia dies in childbirth. Oh. 16. Oh. Here's where the conflicting information comes in. Okay. That's the upsetting stuff. We're, yeah. we're through the upsetting part. Okay. Here's what NewEngland.com has to say, which is not a rebuttal to that, but just is a it just, it just doesn't jive. Mm -hmm. NewEngland.com claims that the final appearance, or one of the final appearances of Nellie's ghosts, uh, ghost was... She appeared before her former husband, George Butler, to give him, quote, a tongue lashing for remarrying. <laughs> so that is in conflict. Total conflict. Yeah, it's not that she wants him to marry Nellie. Now she's pissed that he did marry Nellie. Really raked him across the Nellie, coals. Uh, Lydia. <laughs> Lydia. Yeah, Lydia, yeah. She gave him a tongue lashing for remarrying after promising her on her deathbed that he would never marry another. Oh, well, he probably shouldn't have said that. Shouldn't have said that if you're going to do it, George. So really, it's on George. So it seems like he deserved the tongue lash. It seems like it's on George. If I'm being perfectly <laughs> honest, listen that that is supposedly the first American haunting. Now I do think that it's because it's the closest to our founding. Yes, 1776. Yeah, yeah. Seems like there's got to be something else. Of course. I mean, and also it's the closest documented to right. our founding. Yeah, exactly. Like, there's yeah. no way that for 24 years. Yeah. Of our founding. Of our founding. Not, like, the, if not if not it existed. Millennia prior. Yeah. Like but no ghosts happened. I know. But so there you go. Plenty Nellie died. Butler. Yeah. The ghost of Sullivan. It's even Maine. a good name. Nellie, Nellie Butler. Butler. I know. Nellie. Yeah. I even think about Nellie from like Haunting of Hill House. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nellie Butler, Nellie Hooper. Like all these names are like very yeah. comforting, like Americana. Yeah, they're satisfying. Type names. Mm -hmm. Spielbergian. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. are Spielbergian. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I am next going to tell you not about the first ghost story in America or Maine, but one of Maine's most famous residents. Who undoubtedly knows the story of uh, Nellie Butler. I'm sure. I'm sure he does. Stephen King. But I'm going to tell you about that right after I make sure I tell you about, first of all, I will get to Patreon, which I always do. Very quick, I just want to say thank you so much to everybody who was so friggin' nice about mm. me last week saying that I got laid off and I thought I did a crappy show. Um, so many people were so 
nice and reached out or commented and whatever. And I just wanted to say thank you so much to you all. It really does mean a lot. And it was incredibly sweet and unexpected. Um, so thank you. Those are just the ones you saw. I had to delete William. hordes and hordes of comments mm -hmm. saying that you're a phony, saying that you, you stink and you suck and you, you suck. And they, said you, they said you suck. <laughs> <laughs> Rats. No, it's been like a bizarrely, I, not that you guys aren't always heartwarming, but it's been like an especially heartwarming week. I really didn't even think about, about it, but world. thank you so, so much. Makes me want to fish for it more, huh? Uh, you'd be amazed how much in the past week Kristen and I have just been like, I love doing Guide to the Unknown. Yeah, like, like people are so friggin' nice. A comforting, good place. Totally. And uh, it's it's due, frankly, to, to all of you being so supportive. So thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Thank, thank you, you thank so you. much for that. Um, but our normal spiel, which I'll yeah, get to yeah, so yeah. we can move on, is that we have a Patreon. It's patreon.com slash gttupod. And if you join us over there, we have a bunch of different tiers. You can see which one you like the best. Um, we have a whole second podcast, as I mentioned earlier. I said it's called The Netherworld Dispatch. It comes out every Monday. Um, our demon tier gets all of those weekly episodes. And we have other tiers where you can get them bi-weekly, so every two weeks or monthly. You just check it out and see what works for you. And um, it's really awesome. We have a hundred something. Episodes. 144 as of this recording. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Of the Netherworld Dispatch. So any tier that you join, even if it's one of the tiers that gets only monthly episodes, you're getting a ton of episodes as soon as you join. Oh, yeah. yeah. And I got to tell you, if ever there was a time to sign up, I think we may have just made one of our best episodes ever. I absolutely agree. I really think so. Uh, episode 144 is titled 90s Miracle Men. Yeah. What started as... Who, which tiers got this episode? I don't remember. It's demons. demons. So this is on the demon okay. tier. This was demon only. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's good. it is... I'm not kidding. I'm not exaggerating. I think it might be some of our finest work I over there. Agree. And we totally stumbled into it. Yeah. We originally were just going to do like quizzes online because we like to see like silly quizzes and stuff. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden we're watching trailers for City of Angels starring Nicolas Cage. Yep. Uh, Michael, a forgotten movie where John Travolta plays an angel who smokes cigarettes and dances and like seduces 90s women and stuff. Yeah, he lives with Ethel Merman. <laughs> and <laughs> he fights a bull. It, yeah, he headbutts a bull. It's shocking. It's some weird stuff. And literally on the Netherworld Dispatch, you're you're listening to the clips, you're you're seeing the clips if you watch the video version. Mm-hmm. I, we also visited Phenomenon, uh, another weird John Travolta movie with a kind of paranormal angle, somewhat, and the movie Powder. Yes, which yes. William kept referring to as Pepper. Pepper and cracking me up. <laughs> all of these, all of these bizarre movies where where good, clean, wholesome men gain extraordinary abilities, and yeah. they're all very gentle, but also like kind of gross. Yeah, totally romantic or or kind of disturbing and sick. Yes. Yeah. I, twisted. I, I can't recommend it highly enough. I, I, I had so it. much fun. I wish we could just do it again. I loved it. I know. So that's 144 90s Miracle Men. Go yep. check it out. Patreon.com slash GTTUPod. Thank you to so much to everybody who... Yes, who's already over there. Who's already it's over so there. awesome. And we also have a Discord that you get to join if you join our Patreon, which is completely kick-ass. There is a listener-run Guides the Unknown book club. There's a listener-run Guides the Unknown movie club yep. um, that are both happening on the Patreon. And thank you so much to Chloe and JD who have taken those on. They're happening, all right. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've got a, another review for us that oh, I sweet. love uh, from Mrs. Nicey. Ooh. All so right. Please be nicey, start. Mrs. Nicey. Yeah. Uh, they say, so much fun. I wish I had siblings like these too. <laughs> they are so much fun to listen to, and we love so much of the same things. Though Those days when I'm feeling low, they always pick me up. Oh. My favorite is when they go silent because they're laughing so hard. <laughs> Supporting them on Patreon is money well spent. Thank you so much for the sacrifice of your time and effort. Five stars. Not a sacrifice. No. Fun to do. No, a gift. It's Fun so wonderful. To do. Thank you so much, Mrs. Nicey. Mrs. I love Nicey. that review. That's a great name, by Mrs. the way. Mrs. Nicey. Um, and thank you so much to everybody who leaves us reviews. We're trying to get to a thousand reviews on Apple Podcasts. Yeah, we're getting close. We're getting real close. Yeah, we yeah. really are. So thank you so much. And if you haven't done it, please consider it wherever you listen, whether it's Apple, Spotify, like whatever app it is. Absolutely. Um, but yes. Yeah, thank app, you so much. Hey, absolutely. William. That's pretty cool, right? I wonder if anybody's ever used that before. Pretty clever. There's an app for that. Yeah. People don't say that anymore. No, they don't. They don't. Because we all know. We moved past it. There's no need to. It's not flashy anymore. Like, it's right? like, yeah, of course there is. Yeah. 
Okay. So let me tell you about Stephen King and Maine. Yes, Their please. relationship to each other. Here's basically what I know. I don't. I didn't know that much going into this. Just when we divvied this up, I was like, oh, I know Stephen King and Maine are a thing. Yes. Um, I knew that he lives there and has a house with a spider gate. Yes. Yeah. He's got this fancy wrought iron fence. Yeah. Like a bat on it and stuff. His house is like nice, cool, like fun, creative, creepy guy house. You know but what? not too creepy. It's scary fun. It it is scary fun. Yeah. Our company, Mr. Yes. King, we're suing. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. No, it's scary fun. It's great. Yeah. Um, and that he has a lot of books set there. Yes. And so then I dove a little bit more into that. Um, first we're gonna talk about the books set there. This is a very quick little section because if you live in the area or you're traveling there or something, it's really easy. There are like a million websites that have listed out the places in Maine that have inspired different books and stories. Um, it felt too dry to just be like listing all of those, right, yeah, just yeah. saying like town names. But there were a couple of things that I found interesting while I was researching that I wanted to call out. So Dairy from Stephen King's It is based on Bangor, Maine, which is where oh, okay. his house is. Interesting. And I thought it was kind of neat that apparently he stayed pretty faithful to the geography. So if you're reading that book, there are names of streets and stuff oh, I like that, that are in Bangor, Maine. And he only changed a couple of streets. That's the kind of thing that like, if you are in the know about that, yeah. you sometimes get to be like, oh, it's like, I like feel like I'm in the book or like right. reality feels a little heightened now. Totally. I it's love that. so neat. And another um, it thing is that you know how in it there's a Paul Bunyan statue yeah. that like you know attacks Richie Tozier or whatever. That is a real statue in Bangor. Oh. There's a real Paul Bunyan statue. So that's what inspired that. Okay. So like the same way that like you, for example, will just be like moving through the world because you write fiction stuff. I do not, but you'll be moving through the world and be like, oh, that's a really creepy tree. I don't know. I'm making this up, but then you'll make up a story about the creepy tree. Like, you know, he would see things and be like, huh, that kind of sparks something yeah, yeah, and yeah. right around that. Mm -hmm. I yeah. did base uh, in Blackwood. Some of it's literally based on where I live, Highland Park, mm -hmm. like the main street. Yeah. It's a combination of like very specific places. You right. Know? Yeah. Right. Like you write kind of what you, what you know, what you know, what's around. I thought that was cool. And it's sort of nice in your head to be like, I know this place. Yes. You know? Yeah. One, you it's functional own... so that you can like write about a location and have it feel real because yeah. it's roughly real. Right. But it also feels like you're constructing like your idealized town. Yeah. That you get to just privately keep. Totally. I would imagine it makes it like more personal. Yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. Which is a great thing. Um, I also thought it was neat that Mount Hope Cemetery in Maine, I don't know if it was in Bangor actually, but definitely nearby, has ties to two different Stephen King stories. Um, the first thing is I could see it just being a rumor. I didn't see anything that had him confirming this, but worth mentioning. Um, it said that the grave in the cemetery for Carrie C. Hesseltine inspired Stephen King to name the character Carrie. Carrie. Well, that's interesting. Interesting, but is it true or is I it know. just that somebody saw a grave with the name Carrie in Stephen King's town and put two and two together and then put it out there yeah, and then right. it just gets life on the internet? For all I know, it is totally true, but I didn't find any. I'm not against concrete. it either way. Me Whether either. or not he took inspiration or it's people being like, I know that this place is special to him. Right. Therefore, everything I'm seeing must have some connection. Ties back. I you know. know. Yeah. But... It is certainly special to him because the graveyard was used in the cemetery scene in the Pet Cemetery movie, the oh. original one, where Stephen King himself played the minister. Wow. Yeah, they That's were they cool. did it in Mount Hope Cemetery. That must have been very fun. I know. Like very satisfying. Yeah, yeah, totally. I thought it was so cool. Okay, so now let's talk about his house. Yes, please. So I won't bury the lead. I, I did not know this. Like I said, I just kind of knew that he had a creepy house. Um, he does not live at this place anymore. What? No. Uh, according to the website for 92 Moose FM. Oh, I love it when we have a source like radio that. Radio station. Yeah, yeah. Um, in 92 Moose FM. <laughs> I know. You're listening Check to the show 92 notes. Moose FM. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, he and his wife, Tabitha, now live in their second home in Florida full time for privacy because this house became such a thing, yeah, it's too which known. he loves, by the way, and kind of like plays into in a way that I'll explain. But I can imagine living there and having people constantly taking pictures outside of your gates and stuff. Um, not ideal. 
So what's his address in Florida? <laughs> let's just, yeah, let's send everybody there. <laughs> I know, just head down there. <laughs> um, so, yeah, because this is like so distinctly Stephen Kingy in yeah, a way that yeah. I'm going to describe in just a moment, it has become a tourist destination for, for people around the world because there are Stephen King super fans who this means like yeah. so much to where it would be a big deal to go visit Stephen King's house. I can totally see that. I can, I can totally, totally see, see it. Um, so they take pictures in front and I understand because it looks awesome. That's going to make for a good picture. So the house itself is this like awesome old Victorian house. That's like kind of like a rusty blood red color with off white trim. And then the black fence lining the property is sort of the star of the show. Like, I think this is what people really think of and look forward to seeing when they go to see the house. Yeah. Um, you know, it's always hard to kind of explain these things, but I'll try. Um, so it's a black wrought iron fence lining the property and it has two doors to let cars through. So think of like any rich person house that you've seen in movies or like the Adams family, like two big security doors that will like swing out right. so you can let cars through. And these two doors that can swing out have half a spider web arching across the bottom. So like half a circle. And then above that on each door is a spider with wiggly legs and then on either side of the doors are these higher extended sections that have something that I was having a hard time getting a grasp on, to tell you the truth. I couldn't tell if they were bats or if they were gargoyles on the top. They have these kind of like arching rounded in wings that are sort of spiky on the bottom. And then um, I also saw something and did see a picture of three headed dragons that are adorning the fence somewhere. Huh. And I, I can't really tell what is what. I also think it's not totally impossible that like further down the fence, maybe there are bats and maybe these are actually the dragons. Um, I'm not totally sure. It looks very cool though. I could really only find far away shots and then close up shots of the three headed dragons. Right. All right. We'll, Will pulled up something. In the yeah, video, if you're watching the video version, I, I think I've got, it looks like the front of the gate. Yeah. But you're right. It is sort of hard to tell. No, but this is better. I don't know why I didn't think to zoom. Um, I think that these are kind of bats. And so I think the three-headed dragon exists somewhere else than on the fence. Yeah. And another neat detail that's just like, it's so little, but I think it's cool, is that the body of the spiders that the kind of like wavy legs come off of also has the number of what the house is. So one spider body has a four in it and the other one has a seven. And then the top of the gate is like kind of weird. It has like, I don't, it almost looks like Maleficent's horns. In yeah. A way. Uh -huh. It also kind of looks like boobs. It's just like oh. two big, like arching things that have sort of a curve outward on the top, like the Maleficent horns. I'll tell you what, uh, something that I really like about, and I don't think you can see it on the present version of the Guide to the Unknown logo, mm -hmm. but the first... Oh yeah, you're right. The, the, the when you If you look at the Guide to the Unknown logo, mm -hmm. when it's just trees, not the version with our picture on it, yep. but we have this like tree line, this black trees on a green background. It was, was our podcast logo for a long time. Mm-hmm. Uh, the trees in the middle have this weird swooping thing that makes them look like demon horns. Yes. Which I always liked. Yep. And this gate, you're right, the Maleficent horns kind of motif. I, I like that mm. quite a bit. But I do too. Now that you said boobs, I can't not see that. I know. Which is distracting. I know. That's what I saw first, really. Like when I looked at the gate, I was like, it looks like a set of boobs. And then you see all the other cool spider detailing and everything. Yeah. Um, you know, it's fine. Boobs are cool. Um, <laughs> but it is distracting. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I was seeing cool demon stuff. I know. And you're a pervert. <sighs> William, <laughs> I'm just a person. Uh, so the fence was made by somebody named Terry Steele. Whoa. What a fortuitous Whoa. name for a blacksmith. Born to do it. I know. How cool is that? Um, so apparently there used to be a plaque on the fence that said that it was made by him, but that was stolen, which sucks. And he said that people assume that the Kings had some input on the design or that they designed it themselves. because right. It's all this creepy stuff. Um, but they actually didn't. Tabitha King, Stephen King's wife, saw Terry Steele's work in an art show in 1980 and asked if he'd be willing to talk about doing a project for her. And he didn't know who she was or anything. And then here's a quote from him. And again, links in the show notes um, where this is from. 
quote, I had no idea who she was until I drove up to the house just as Stephen King drove up in a red caddy, Steele said. They gave me full license on design with no suggestions as to subject matter other than to have the project reflect who Stephen King is and allowed me any time necessary to complete the project. Um, which is really neat. So it's the dream. Yeah, I know. I the know. dream. Do do do, do what, what you, you will do. for as yeah. long as it takes. Yeah. <laughs> Probably not too constricting of a budget if he's driving up in like his you know, red Cadillac. Yep. I think it, he was like living high on the hog by 1980. And way uh, up on that hog. Yeah. And totally awesome. So in one of the pictures of the the fence in the home that was on TripAdvisor, mm-hmm. it looks like people are leaving red clown noses on oh. the spires of the fence um, as it goes around, which is kind of fun, I like actually, it. Yeah. especially knowing that he doesn't live there anymore. I could see if he lived there, maybe it could be like a little annoying a pain or something. In the ass. A total pain in the ass. Like Someone's it, in there, you know? or is it just a caretaker? No. No? Mm-mm. I think it's really cool. Um, I'll Let me just fast okay, forward so to I'm that. Okay, I'm sorry. No, no, it's fine. It doesn't really matter, and I'll just go back to something. So what they did is everything reports that this is actual and current and happening okay however when you go on stephen king's website i don't think this is i don't think this is a current thing i think it's something that they wanted to do and it seems to me like perhaps the pandemic got in the way Ah. um so on his blog in 2019 stephen king wrote that there's a lot of misinformation going on about his house and people saying that it's a museum now and stuff which Uh i saw and it wasn't the case he said that he applied to have it turned into a non-profit that would house the archives of his works which had previously been at a university in maine maybe even like the university of maine or whatever um and that it won't be open to the public but the archives will be available for researchers and scholars to review by appointment. Huh. And he was also planning for it to become a writer's retreat oh. where writers would live in the guest house that is, you know, just set off from the main house or whatever. And, and they would have access to the main house to look at the archives or whatever. And he wanted it to be able to host up to five writers at a time. That's really cool. Isn't that so cool? But on his blog where he wrote that, he said that it was going to take a year or two for all of the necessary paperwork to go through on yeah. this. Uh-huh. And then obviously the pandemic happened and there weren't any newer um, articles about this on his blog. And everything that I read seemed to be referencing stuff from 2019. So I don't know that this has actually happened yet. Yeah. For yeah. who knows what reasons, you know? That's interesting. Um, it's, a, it's a wonderful idea. It's a great idea. I think it's really, really cool. Um, but you can er, uh, anybody can stop by and take pictures of the fence. Um, but the inside, it seems like it's become just sort of a rumor that it, it's a museum now and that you could go see his original works and it's not true. Which itself is kind of cool. I like that. Yeah. I like that he's almost like he's a folk hero mm-hmm. or a, like a local hero. Totally. And I like the idea that there's like misinformation or like a misunderstanding about the the life and times of Stephen King. Yeah, absolutely. That's kind of cool. The the house is as much a legend as as he is in a way. Yeah, totally. And I bet a lot of people think that he still lives there. I did. I didn't know that. I thought he lived there. Yeah, Yeah. for sure. Um, So... Uh, yeah, I, I think it's fun. I think it's time to move. <laughs> Tabitha. Tabitha, they're leaving Pack noses the again. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I slipped on another damn nose. It's time to move to Florida. <laughs> we got to get out of here. Time to move to Florida. Get away from all these noses. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Talking like that guy. Slipping on what's the... that? What's sh- that man's name? I Sometimes... Sli- Sometimes Florida is better. Well, you're doing the I know you're doing the John Lithgow version because I can't do that other one. Slipped on another nose down by the road. <laughs> <laughs> Car slid across name? all these noses on the road. <laughs> the road. Fred Gwynn. Well, yeah, but what's the name of the character in? Oh, I don't know. We're being the caretaker from Pet Cemetery. Pet Cemetery. Yeah. yeah, I started listening to Pet Cemetery recently. Oh, really? Do you yeah. like it? Yeah, I like it quite it's a bit. It's narrated by Michael C. Hall, right? Yeah, it is. It's distracting. Because he's so good, but like I only hear Dexter. Yes. You know? I actually think I have Pet Cemetery in my library, and I think I started it and didn't finish it for yeah. whatever reason. Because mm-hmm. he, I think he just sounded like Dexter or I whatever. Know. Yeah. Um, I, I really, since we started doing podcasts together like 10 years ago, mm-hmm. I've become a real Stephen King fan, and I was yeah. not in the beginning. I remember being kind of like, 
the the folksy quality of Stephen King stuff yeah would have a habit of sometimes like shutting me down yes uh, and, and uh, uh, but over the course of years I think from looking at spooky stuff and occasionally like we did book reviews of some mm-hmm. of his stuff on our old show book club schmook club mm-hmm. like I feel like I really at some point clicked with like I'm like oh I get it now I see it and I yeah. like he really is like a lot of people go like oh he's just very prolific he writes a lot. And it, people make fun of him where they're like, that. his endings are bad and he writes gross sex stuff. And that's true. Yeah, yeah. That's really true. Yes, it is. But his ideas, just the pure, oh, yeah. simple ideas themselves alone, forget being how prolific as he is, his ideas are amazing. It's incredible how creative he is. I haven't really yeah. come around. I would say I'm a fan loosely. I haven't really come around to... I, I don't know. There's a lot of stuff that I, it's just like not totally my taste, but I really, really respect him and like him. Like yeah. there are pl- plenty of things that are annoying or like not my jam or whatever, but like what a cool guy, what a mm-hmm. cool life. Yep. How amazing that he has given all of these stories to the world. Mm-hmm. And so many of them have like resonated with people in such a like deep and meaningful way. Yep. He has given so much enjoyment to so many people. That's true. And it's, in a it's spooky amazing. way. So I just enjoy that theoretically. I'm like, I love yeah. that that's a thing. I think he's awesome. He's not always my cuppa. Sure. But like, I think he's great. He's like an institution. He is an institution. And like a living Undeniably, legend. Like yeah. what a cool guy. No, when you, when you think of him as being a cool guy, you ever see that segment of Creep Show where he gets covered in moss? Yes. Like <laughs> that's a cool guy. <laughs> Look at this cool guy. <laughs> Look at this cool guy right here. He's going like, the oh, whole what? I, He's an actor in this one segment of Creep Show, which he yes. wrote with uh, George Romero. And it's like, what a cool guy. <laughs> yeah, no, totally. <laughs> but yeah, I mean- Great. Many kudos to Mr. King. Yeah, I know. Um, So there is something else about their house that I think is so, so cool. And it doesn't get a lot of player attention completely understandably because it's on the property of their house. It's not like outside the gates where people can be taking pictures of it or be taking pictures in front of it and stuff. Um, There is this wood sculpture made from a tree trunk that is so friggin' cool. And um, I love it. So I'm going to tell you about it. Okay. So in 2020, Stephen King tweeted, there was a dead ash tree in our front yard. My wife, Tabitha, had an idea to turn it into a sculpture featuring books and animals. The sculptor was Josh Landry. He did it with a chainsaw. It is completely wild. It is one of the neatest things I've seen. And it's going to be hard to explain. So it might be a good one to Google. But I think it's really neat because it preserves the idea of being a tree while still having all of this like kind of batshit stuff carved yeah. into it. Because I've heard of chainsaw. I've seen chainsaw carvings of trees where they like take a tree mm-hmm. trunk and turn it into like a dolphin. Right. Now yes. it just looks like a wood dolphin. Exactly. This still has branches and stuff yeah. that there's like a giant owl perching on that there are, I guess, ravens or something perching on. And like, if you look at the bottom of it, the trunk is still preserved. It's almost like a little cross section of the trunk that you can see. So it's not pretending not to be a tree. It's incorporating everything. And I think it's the neatest thing. That is really cool. Um, So let me see. Sorry, I lost my place. So um, I mentioned the branches with birds and an owl. And in the front of it, it kind of looks like a bookshelf was carved into the trunk in the front with books, a cat curled up, and a corgi, which the artist Landry did as a nod to the king's love of corgis, including Molly, who Stephen King refers to as the thing of evil on yeah. Twitter. So she's kind of become like a little uh, mascot almost for Stephen King. That's cool. Um, the carved bookshelf is standing on human legs, which are standing on a section of the stump so again it preserves those natural elements and the back has a dragon popping out of the tree as a kind of nod to stephen king's book the eye of the dragon um the artist said that tabitha actually suggested that and i think it's really sweet how it seems like tabitha is really involved in the artistic side of their home like she kind of like pulled in or sourced the guy for the fence. Yeah. Um, she also was really involved in the design of this tree trunk. And I actually didn't write it down, but he said that she said something like, you know, I want to nod to his work. Like, I think it'd be cool if there was like a dragon or like talons or something. Cause he really likes that sort of thing. And so 
I thought that was really sweet that in the creative projects that she has, like, it seems like she is really proud of him and likes incor incorporating aspects of his work that is really into cool. them. Yeah. And then I thought to myself, well, maybe it's not all that. Maybe it's not all about incor incorporating aspects of his work. Maybe she is just into this stuff, too. Maybe she likes cool totally. stuff. Mm -hmm. And so it, like, works for both of them. And so I looked her up, and it turns out that Tabitha is an author as well, oh. seemingly of thriller books. And um, it looks like they have gotten mixed reviews. Okay. But it showed me that her taste tends to skew a little dark, too, which isn't really that surprising. It seems like that could be something that they have in common mm -hmm. and that they both enjoy bearing out, like, in their environment. It really seems like I, – I mean, listen, people's lives are people's lives. Mm -hmm. But, like, you know, I'm, I'm sure that they have their hardships. I'm sure they have their good days and bad. But everything you just described sounds incredibly wonderful. <laughs> It seems incredibly sweet. They definitely had their hardship. Like she was with him when he was going through like major alcohol problems and yeah. like misuse and stuff. And so I I honestly, I just kind of skimmed it because it wasn't really that relevant. But like there was an article that was like about their hard times and how she stuck with him through the hard times. So there was like that, his addiction. And then also him getting hit by a car yeah. remember and like yep. being like incredibly injured and so it seems like they've had a lot of ups and downs and i just think it's i just think it's sweet i, I it seems like she is like very proud of him and enthusiastic and it seems like he is too yeah. he, he writes about tabitha a lot even just like in tweets and things like that yeah he's a prolific tweeter too yes i don't know when this dude's not writing i know uh it's he even has a very famous book crazy. about writing called On Writing. Yeah, that's, that's right. It's wonderful. Great. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's pretty wonderful. Um, so that's pretty much it. I hope that they're enjoying their lives in Florida. Yeah, I, I hope so, too. Yeah. I, 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 this, I, and I bet they have a totally normal looking house so that they can just like. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm sure. Can you think of like who else's house is famous? That's a good question. Like Edgar Allan Poe's house that he grew up in, but it's not like he ever. Dead dead living um, do you know any living celebrity who you're like i know where their house is <laughs> no but in the not so distant past like michael jackson with neverland like everybody know who knew where that is that's and, like, true that Graceland, is true land that's Elvis. good um well and and so still like contro c controversy aside yeah you're talking about like michael jackson is is like a legend yeah. right uh uh elvis Legend. Mm -hmm. Stephen King. Liberace. Liberace. Legend. Legend. Behind the candelabra. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Charles Nelson Riley. Chrissy just gave us. <laughs> <laughs> now let me just see the sculpture. <laughs> <laughs> now that I don't know if anyone knows what I just did. I do. Which is also Charles Nelson Riley, but it's specifically Alec Baldwin doing Charles Nelson Riley <laughs> on Saturday Night Live that one time. It's really funny. It's very funny. Yeah. All right. We're getting real weird. Okay. Now, Stephen King is probably a legend on that level. Yeah, I think so. Like, will be known forever. Yes, I think so. Forever and ever and ever. Mm -hmm. And he's got a house that we're like, that's Stephen King's house. Yeah. It's just so crazy. Like, it is crazy. Yeah. Wonderful. I wonder if, you know... I bet he didn't set out for it to be like that. You no. know what I mean? Like, I think that Michael Jackson and Elvis did. And Liberace. Like, they have, like, you know, get, like, Graceland yeah. from above. Like, if you look from a plane, it said, like, Graceland, I think, in, like, flowers or something Exactly. Like that. And, like, think about, like, how much, I mean, think about how Elvis dressed. <laughs> a flashy guy. He, he wanted the attention. He's not right? going incognito. And, like, Liberace had, like crazy gates with musical notes on mm -hmm. them neverland i think also says neverland on the front and like yeah seems the, like a hellscape the 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 musician world of showbiz is that like real flashy gaudy right look at me love me want me <laughs> kind of life shower me with kisses <laughs> 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 from Seinfeld. <laughs> Getting real weird at the I end know, here, okay, everybody. anyway. But, but like I, Stephen King as a writer is like, he's legendary for being like, kind of like a guy at a typewriter. And I could see it just being like, I got some money and this would be sweet. Like, this is just my preference for the way to live. Just snowballed. Not necessarily like to show everybody Stephen King lives here. It's just yeah. like, we're going to have a gate. What if mm -hmm. it looked friggin' awesome and Snowballed because he wrote good stuff and yeah. stuck to it. Yeah, you know totally. I mean? And then he became more and more well known where people would be like, oh my God, Stephen King, who writes horror movies, also lives in a house with like a spider gate. Yeah. That's so on the nose in a great way. I love that. We should go there. It really is. It really yeah. is great. Yeah. It, it truly is. I feel like very like warmed to Stephen King. That's as, a good as word I said, for it. I feel warm toward him. My appreciation and fondness of him as an individual has grown 
massively over the last uh, 10 years. Yeah. My appreciation for, for his work has grown massively. You talking about his like life in, in Maine and like basing his work there and like the, yeah. the, the, the house and the, the design of all this stuff. It like gave me like a real fondness it just seems lovely. for the entire body of it all. Yes. I think it's such a sweet, it, it seems yeah. like he's had a, a lovely, lovely life with a lot of his, he and his wife both have a lot of enthusiasm. Yep. For Bravo. It. Yeah, I think it's sweet. It's time for Mr. King to finally get some applause. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's about time. <laughs> about time. He got his due. So must, uh, here at Guide to the Unknown to Mr. King, we salute you. We salute you. Yeah. Um, all right, everybody. Well, I think that's going to do it for us yeah, here totally. this week. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple of stories from Maine, a living legend yeah. and uh, the first legend. ghost ever Yeah. in, in America. Right. That's the Alpha and the Omega, <laughs> truly, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Well, there you go, everybody. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for hanging out with us. We hope that you enjoyed the episode. We hope you maybe got something out of it that you didn't know before. Just had yeah. a good time kicking back and hanging out and hearing some scary, fun stuff. Absolutely. Uh, please consider sharing the show with some friends, write some tweets. We always love it when people help us boost the signal. Yes. And if you enjoyed this episode, please go check out patreon.com slash GTTU pod where you can support us and get access to the Netherworld Dispatch, our second podcast that we're doing over there every single week. Find a tier that fits. Yep. Uh, I sh I'm sure that you can find one and totally. uh, I think your life will be enriched with more uh, weird weird stories. Go check out I that 90s so. Miracle Men episode at least. You got to you got to see you got to see phenomenon. It's incredible and we usually don't talk about the next episode but just as a teeny <laughs> tease we just recorded it and it was also great. It's all about Dan Aykroyd. It's all about Dan Aykroyd. And it's wild. It's it's unbelievable everybody. Yeah. We're having a blast. We hope that you are too. Yeah. Uh follow at GTTU Pod on all social media. Mm -hmm. Uh the new home of Guide to the Unknown on a, on a little website scaryfun.fun. Yeah. Head on over. Scaryfun.com was taken. They scary wanted fun thousands. Fun. And then we looked at scaryfun.fun and we were like. It's kind of funny. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> scaryfun.fun. Right. Why not? So go check that out. It's got all of our shows, everything, maybe maybe future stuff. It's where yeah. in the future, it's where I plan to post some writing, yeah. old and new, mm -hmm. maybe some articles and stuff. Uh, we'll expand, expand our little fiefdom Absolutely. a little bit, I think. Yep. Um, and uh, you can also follow us on social media. I am yeah. at Chillin' Kristen. I'm at The Myth Traveler. And uh, we'll see you next week, everybody, for more weird, strange explorations. Who knows what's out there? But until that time comes, we must travel. Back to the netherworld, go we. Back to the Dark Tower. Oh, that's right. We're all part of Stephen King's multiverse, you know? Oh, yeah. That's the thing that I think. <laughs> the knowledge that he had written himself into that story is what had initially soured me. Yeah. But again, I think my fondness of it all, I know, it's I, like, a pl I think he was being more playful than I thought he was. I think that's true. And I also kind of admire the hubris. I know. I know. Now. It's, it's an it's earned getting hubris. getting older and being a little bit less, I don't being know, like, I'm just going to write myself things. into this story. Yeah. Or no, I mean us being like, you know what? Screw it. That's kind of oh, crazy and fun. Yeah, it could be. Yeah. Could be. Dude. Getting older all the time. I'm a little old lady right now. Oh my God, I am. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, I am. <laughs>